Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for the introduction. And the title of my paper, as you all know, is Wildly Hours 4.0, uh, Colonial Narratives of Wildlife. I may explain the 4.0 here because this is a series of articles that I'm doing, and this one is the fourth one in that series. So I'll start with my paper today. Colonialism has been widely discussed for the economic, political, and social subjugation of one country or people by another country or people. What has been not been adequately discussed is the impact colonialism had on non-human animals, particularly the wildlife of the colonized country. The plunder and massacre that the forests and wildlife of the Indian subcontinent experienced continues to be underestimated. And while my paper today will focus on the colonial destruction of wildlife on the Indian subcontinent, but it is important to remember that this issue, destruction of uh, wildlife uh, under European colonialist, colonial rules in several continents is a global issue. By scientific estimation, more animals and birds have become extinct in the last 200 years than ever before in history. Most of the animals in the current list of endangered animals are those that were hunted in colonial context. Most of the killing was neither accidental nor for mere survival of the human beings, but were the result of systematic extermination born of both fulfillment of need and of the worldview held by the colonizers. The systematic extermination required and followed a kind of discourse. In 1870s, for example, it was suggested in Texas that eliminating the bison would be to eliminate the Native American and therefore bison should be eliminated. In Australia, the, the, the native animals, wildlife was exterminated because the colonizers wanted to bring in British fauna. And they thought that all the Australian animals were very stupid. So extermination happened for symbolic reasons and for fun simply. It also generated discourse between the colonizers and the colonized. At times, the cooperation of the colonized was bought with money, at other times it was commanded, and at yet other times instant instances of conflicts arose between a conflict between the two. In this paper today, I will take up the case of Tiger and will focus on the narratives of Jim Corbett, a hunter, a shikari as it's called in North India, who became the pioneer of tiger protection and conservation in India also a Britisher loved by the local people and acknowledged by the post-independence Indian state when the first National Reserve Park was named Corbett Tiger Reserve. Tiger is native to the Indian subcontinent and has been represented in religions and cultures forever. Scholars have talked of the religious environmentalism of Indic religions, Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. The narrative traditions of Panchtantra and Jataka have also been the vehicle for the communication of these ideas. Tiger status in the Indian culture is comparable only to the elephant and both have symbolized spiritual, religious and political power at different times. Both animals have the status of sacred animals in Hinduism and Buddhism. They have been feared and revered by the populace. Hunting elephants was never a sport, although elephants were captured for religious purposes and labor. Tiger was not hunted by the ordinary people, but by kings and nobility. Yet this form of hunting was never at a scale so as to threaten the existence of the, of the tiger. Tiger was the staple of folk narrative Indian people's relationship with the tigers was not only of fear, quotes open, at no time were tigers the most lethal animals for the animal for Indians. Snakes caused far more deaths. And that was stomach. Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, I think you would all know it, 
was first published in 1894. Have you ever wondered why the tiger Sher Khan is portrayed so unsympathetically? Quotes open. In the Jungle Book, no other animal is treated with such unbridled contempt by Kipling as the tiger Sher Khan and dies a dog's death. Why? To answer that question, we need to delve into the relationship between the Indian tiger and the British men. Quotes open. Both the East India Company and the British Raj encouraged destruction of tigers and other predators by offering financial rewards to hunters. Quotes closed. That was Ramek Historian 2006. Right from the beginning, the tiger was the most attractive animal owing to its natural powers, but also because of its symbolic value. Right from the beginning, tiger was the most attractive animal owing to its natural powers, but also because of its symbol symbolic value. This became even more heightened when the Indian ruler, Tipu Sultan, who challenged British militarily and became a major threat, and he had tiger as a symbol. Above all, he possessed the prototype of a mechanical tiger killing a white man. This piece is in the Victoria and Albert Museum today. Victory over Tipu, Tipu Sultan was a turning point for the British and for their relationship with the tiger. Hunting the tiger was no more sport, but symbolic of the subjugation of India, particularly after the rebellion of 1857. By the 19th century, it was tradition that every other British officer went on tiger hunts and wounded and killed tigers. This killing was not one to one, but hundreds of animals, men, animals and men were involved in snaring the tiger to a point where the British man sitting on a tree or on an elephant could just fire the shot. Even so, there were umpteen situations where the tiger escaped, most often wounded by the amateur shot. Historian Vijay Ramdas Mandela argues that the reason for killing tigers was not just sport, but that the tiger stood in colonialism's ruthless expansion into the forest. Quotes open. In 19th century India, tigers threatened the colonial construction of dams, reservoirs, engineering, and the railways. The colonial government had to arrange hunters to kill the tigers in the vicinity. Quotes close, Mandela 2015. Many scholars, especially historians, have discussed British hunts and policies, but few have written how people responded to these. Ezra Rushkov has written about the local resistance to British hunting there were a large number of cases where the local people or villagers intervened and tried to stop the hunting of various animals and birds. When a certain species of cro crocodiles found in the Ganges River were about to be shot by some British hunters, some washermen who were washing clothes down the bank pushed all the crocodiles back into the water. When hunters tried to shoot peacock, Villagers did everything from throwing stones to attacking the hunters in order to save the peacocks. Rashko, basing his research on the newspaper reports as well as archival documents, says, quotes open, clashes between sportsmen and villagers were an increasingly frequent occurrence across the length and breadth of rural pre-independence India, quotes close. Along with religious environmentalism, scholars have also identified ecological nationalism as a cause for people's resistance. So here you can see actually some of these images from the time, uh, the, uh, British officers shooting the tiger and the tiger and the lion, lion being the same symbol of Britain, attacking the tiger and tiger just cowing away. Or here, a railway station in the third photo under construction being visited by a tiger. Again, a railway line being laid and a tiger uh, very much present there. So the hunting of the tigers by the British officers became uh, uh, a very major, major issue. 
towards the third quarter of the 19th century, the effects of British hunting practices were already visible and needed to be taken cognizance of. In 1878, the Forest Act was passed, which reserved the tiger hunt for the British only. Now, at that point, um, you know, the, the statistics have been compiled for this period, 1875 to 1924, and that was after 100 years of British rule already. Um, uh, so over 50 years, the tigers killed 80,000, leopards 150,000, wolves 200,000. At that point, when so much killing of the tigers had happened, at that point emerged a new menace, that of man-eater tigers, that is tigers who attacked and killed human beings. This is not normal for tiger. They do not normally attack human beings. Himalayan region being one of the main locations of tigers in India became so prone to it that it became a matter of law and governance. The state called hunters and declared prizes for shooting the man-eaters, but the success was negligible until a hunter called James Edward Cor Corbett came on the scene. James Corbett, better known as Jim Corbett, was a second generation British resident of India, specifically of Kumau region in Himalayas. His father and he himself had been low level officials of the government. This is an important fact because it distinguishes him from several other high-level bureaucrats whose children went away to England for education, like Rudyard Kipling, who was also sent away as a child. And even if they returned to India as officials, they had not grown up in India. Jim Corbett, on the other hand, had grown up in the vicinity of the hill station of Nanital, and his family had bought land in the rural area. He grew up with the locals, imbibing their language, culture, and beliefs particularly about the fauna of the region. In his case, familiarity led to appreciation as is evident in his writing. At the time of the menace of the man-eaters in Himalayas, he offered his services to the government. Folklore has it that he made it a condition that he will be allowed to go alone without the paraphernalia of the state. Evidence shows that he asked the authorities not to permit another hunter in the region entrusted to him and to withdraw the prize money that had been offered publicly. Here started a journey that made Corbett a household name in the region and led to his vast amount of writing. By his own admission, he loved India and he loved the tiger. While Indians loved him back, the same cannot be said of the tiger. Comparing Corbett with Rudyard Kipling, Basav Datta Chanda says, quotes open, Kipling, 1865 to 1936, and Corbett, 1875 to 1955, were contemporaries. While the writings of the former, that is Kipling, while the writings of the former betray colonial arrogance, Corbett's books breathe the essence of love for India, which he passionately calls my India. In the past three decades, scholars, mainly historians, have studied Jim Corbett in the context of colonial environmental history. Scholars have tried to understand whether or not Corbett was a man of the imperialist power structure. My focus differs from them in that I focus on Corbett's narratives about tigers, about hunting them, and about himself because the cause of his immense popularity and the success of his advocacy for conservation and protection of tiger is, I believe, rooted in his art and craft of storytelling. As many of these stories are about man-eating tigers, it is perhaps desirable to explain why these animals develop man-eating tendencies, course close. So starts Jim Corbett's first work, with an explanation for the acts of the tiger. He explains, quotes again, human beings are not the natural prey of tigers 
and it is only when tigers have been incapacitated through wounds or old age that in order to live, they are compelled to take to a diet of human flesh, quotes close. This was common knowledge among the Indian populace, but Corbett provides the reason for change. Quotes open. The stress of circumstances is, in nine cases out of 10, wounds of a carelessly fired shot and failure to follow up and recover the wounded animal. Quotes close. The Corbett exonerates the tiger of any guilt or charge of killing human beings. He lays the blame squarely on the shooters, and although he does not explicitly say so, but by law, the shooters were exclusively British. The same humdrum official who just went on shikar hunting to prove their masculinity or for fun. Each of Corbett's stories is about one particular hunt, but it is not only about the hunt. His narrative is about the hills, the flora, the fauna, the people, their lives and beliefs. Jim Corbett walked or hiked to remote locations on foot with a couple of unarmed local companions, but in every location he met with as many local people as lived there and particularly the families of the victims. One of Corbett's stories is titled, The Temple Tiger. It was from a temple priest that he asked about the presence of tigers or game in the, in the vicinity. The priest told him, quotes open, yes, there is the temple tiger. I have no objection, Sahib, to your trying to shoot the tiger, but neither you nor anyone else will ever succeed in killing it. The emphasis is not mine. This particular tiger was called the temple tiger by local people because he used to frequently visit that temple and hang around its open foyer. This act had added a supernatural, even divine dimension to him. Corbett decided to shoot him because he had been troubling the villagers nearby by killing cattle. Corbett came across the tiger several times pulled his trigger on almost all the occasions. But strange things happened. Once he made a mistake and the new rifle did not fire. Another time he fired and was sure he had shot the tiger, but then saw him running up the mountain curve. On, an, on another occasion, the tiger almost sensed as he lifted his rifle and disappeared. Finally, one evening, Corbett sat 20 feet high on an oak tree overlooking the kill that Tiger had left to eat later. The tiger came to the kill, ate voraciously uh, while looking straight into Corbett's eyes all the time. Corbett waited for the moment when he would look away. And just when he did, Corbett raised his rifle, but the tiger withdrew into the bushes before he could fire. He waited, feeling sure that the tiger's head would pop up again. Minutes passed and then I heard the tiger. I had skirted around the bushes and approaching from behind, started to claw my, started to claw my tree where the thick growth of small branches on the trunk made it impossible for me to see him. Purring with pleasure, the tiger once again clawed the tree with vigor while I sat on my branch and rocked with silent humor. I know that crows and monkeys have a sense of humor, but until that day, I did not know that tigers also possess this sense. Nor did I know that an animal could have the luck and the impudence that this particular tiger had quotes close. Corbett's narrative transforms from a narrative of violence to a narrative of play across species. The priest's words rang in his ears and he felt, quotes open, the tiger was now in his own way confirming what the priest had said, and yet he decided to shoot one last time. His companions later told him that they heard the shot and saw the tiger running away with his tail in the air. 
Corbett left the camp next day. Since he never heard of anyone shooting the temple tiger, he felt convinced that, quotes open, this old warrior, like an old soldier, just faded away, quotes close. So he could not kill the temple tiger. Colbert's first mission was to kill the Champawat man-eater, who was a tigress, and had killed several men and women. Colbert saw and narrated the pathetic condition of the victims and their families. The narration is so personalized that both the tiger and the hunter gain personalities which are involved in a fatal combat. This combat continued over the next many weeks and another day he managed to fire two shots at her, but only wounded her and, quotes open, sat with rifle to shoulder, wondering what it would be best for me to do when she charged because the rifle was empty and I had no more cartridges, quotes close. He had brought only three cartridges, as he tells us. As I told you, that Corbett is very popular in the folklore of the region. And in the folklore of the region, however, it is said Corbett used to carry only one bullet, saying that this way, both the tiger and he have one shot at each other. Although Cor Corbett never says so that he carried only one bullet, but he is very close to it. Like with every other tiger, he checks the dead tiger tigress and tells the reason for her turning a man-eater, quotes open. I found the upper and lower canine teeth on the right side of the mouth were broken. This permanent injury to her teeth, the result of a gunshot wound, had prevented her from killing her natural prey and had been the cause of her becoming a man-eater, quotes close. Corbett tells us of the Chowgar man-eater who started stalking Corbett but was finally shot down, had broken claws and canine. Corbett's narratives are, however, not only about stalking and shooting tigers. They are also simply about tigers and the relationship that emerges even in the process of hunting. While telling us about the Mohan man-eater, he tells the readers, that a tiger can, quotes open, eat a sambar. Sambar is a very big deer, very typical to Indian subcontinent, a very huge deer. They all, uh, so he tells us a tiger can eat a sambar in two days and a buffalo in three, leaving possibly a small snack for the fourth day, quotes close. Corbett's narratives rise above the action story when he shares his feelings. For example, he killed the Mohan man-eater while the tiger was asleep on a sunny field after his meal. Corbett tells the readers what went on in his mind after he had killed him to justify the method to himself and the conclusion he reached. Quotes open. These arguments were the arguments in his own mind to justify his own act. These arguments were A, that tiger was a man-eater, that was better dead than alive. B, therefore it made no difference whether it was awake or asleep when killed. And C, had I walked away when I saw his belly heaving up and down, I should have been morally responsible for the death of all the human beings he killed thereafter. But the regret remains that through the fear of consequences to myself or fear of losing the only chance I might ever get or possibly a combination of the two, I did not awaken the sleeping animal and give him a sporting chance." Quotes close. From an expert hunter, Corbett becomes a man with doubts and regrets. It is due to these deep conflicts within that Corbett later turned to shooting tigers with a camera, admitting that a photograph is a bigger pleasure for the sportsman than the acquisition of a trophy. He was inspired by Fed Champion's book with a camera in the tiger land, but himself decided to go cine with 16 mm camera. Finally, let's turn to the most famous of Corbett's narratives, the man-eater leopard of Rudraprayag. This was the killing of a man-eater leopard who had been, who had escaped many shooters. 
over a decade. When killed by Corbett, this leopard too was found with several injuries left by a former gunshots and embedded pellets. Corbett talks of the gratitude of people, quotes open, I have on occasion witnessed gratitude, but never as I witnessed it on that day in Rudraprayag. While he stood at the bazaar, people came, told him about their son or mother or father or daughter that had been killed by the leopard. And then as per custom, threw petals of flowers at his feet. Tragedy upon pitiful tragedy. And while I listened, the ground under my feet was strewn with flowers. Quotes close. This is in his memory in Rudra Prayag. This one sentence shows Corbett's immense talent as a storyteller, which is perhaps the biggest reason why his stories remain popular. I mean, they have become part of the folk narrative. So that's why his stories uh, remain so, so popular and well-read. Well more than a decade, after, more than a decade after the Rudra Prayag uh, success in 1942, he was in Merit doing some war job, that is looking after the people, uh, wounded soldiers from the World War II. Among them, among the wounded soldiers, Corbett meets a young man who has returned crippled. Both his legs have been, have been uh, chopped off. And when he learns that the white man in front of him is Jim Corbett, he somehow gets out of his wheelchair to touch his feet and narrate that he was a young boy in a distant village when Rudra Prayag man-eater was shot. But he had heard the whole operation from his father. He was now proud to go back and tell his father that he had seen and spoken with Corbett. The pathos of the young man's situation is not lost on Corbett. Quotes open, he says of the boy, no thought of telling of brave deeds done but only eager to tell his father that with his own eyes he had seen the man, a man whose only claim to remembrance was that he had fired one accurate shot. Quotes close. Such people and their oral narratives have gone across generations and kept Corbett's, Corbett's memory reverberating through the hills. That's why when the BBC shot a film on Corbett's legacy in 1980s, elderly people from, came down from remote mountains believing that Tarpit Sahib, he's often called Karpit Sahib, had come back, quotes open. When it came to the question of contested priorities and loyalties, Corbett, however, always believed that he stood by the people of Garhwal and Kumau. Jim Corbett stands out in his hunting narratives less as a representative of a formal administrative apparatus and more as a local people's man. Quotes close. Mandela, 2014. Jim Corbett's case lets us see violence against non-human animals in a very wide perspective, where violence becomes humane and leads to anti-violence. An animal whose natural powers, beauty, and importance in the food chain make him a cultural icon, even though he largely lives outside the human view. A tradition of tiger hunt that was limited to a few transformed into physical and ideational violence under British colonialism. Corbett's portrayal of the tigers has nothing in common with the way British writers and visual artists had portrayed the Indian tiger for more than a century before him. This difference from the discourse of all other English writers is what defines Corbett and his relationship to the colonial state. And not the question whether he criticized the colonial government's policies or not. He was part of a tradition of violence, but turns it around in a manner so as to show the violence of that tradition and change public perspective forever. He changes the mega narrative and causes not just a paradigm shift, but a paradigm overthrow. Jim Corbett is the bomb on the wounds inflicted by the violence of British colonialism 
on the Indian tiger. Regrettably though, the long tradition of violence had caused irreversible damage. Quotes open. The first ever tiger census conducted in 1972, that is about after uh, 25 years of India's independence. So the first ever tiger census conducted in 1972 revealed the existence of merely 1,827 tigers, 1,827 tigers, quotes close. After legal ban on shooting imposed in 1973 and investment of billions of dollars, the tiger population in India has risen to nearly 3,000. That is less than the number of tigers shot in two years of British regime. Most recently, a serious Indian newspaper, Economic Times, did a monetary calculation. If the marginal cost of conserving a tiger is rupees 30 million, then the reparations owed to the Indian environment for the killing of, say, 50,000, just 50,000 tigers, never mind the lakhs of elephants, cheetahs, leopards, dinosaurs, and other wild animals hunted during British rule. So the reparation for 50,000 tigers should be about 15 billion pounds. Violence against non-human animals has been, since time, times immemorial, a fact of every society, including societies based on religions that oppose such violence philosophically. More importantly, opposition to such violence is also equally old. Folk narratives have documented cruelty against non-human animals, even accepted that victory over a tough animal made someone a hero, but in more instances, it has shown animals as intelligent, sensitive, knowledgeable about the environment, and helpful to human beings. Their gratitude to a helpful human being has been narrated too. The same engagement is not seen in any other epistemological tradition. Chinwa Achebe, the Nigerian novelist, cited a proverb in 1994 in an interview for Paris Review, quotes open, until the lions have their historians, until the lions have their historian, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Quotes close. Indeed, the very notion of history seems to be the preserve of the human species, and all non-human animals have been relegated to the status of beings without memory and without history. The huge stock of Indo-European folk narrative, as also of other regions and cultures, has depicted non-human animals as beings with agency. Jim Corbett becomes the historian of the Indian tiger through mixing his experiences with folk narratives and beliefs. It is also worth pondering whether the difference and distance between human and animal is a matter of culture. Is this a subject to be discussed globally without reference to time and, and space? Or the great differences between cultures are also located in matters of human violence against non-human animals and nature. Historian Mahesh Rangarajan feels that the distinction between culture and nature is, quotes open, quite foreign to South Asian history, quotes close. And, Scholars should be careful not to reinscribe the illusion uh, and export it globally. The difference in narrative cultures have been making themselves evident in recent prominent environmental movements. The 2016 Dakota Access Pipeline protest by Standing Rock tribe joined by many other Native American communities. The ongoing 30 meters telescope protest in Hawaii led by Hawaiians and joined by the international community. In 2017, the river Wanganui in New Zealand was granted legal personhood after 160 years of protests by the Maoris. All these protests are fueled by narratives about places and spaces, and the co conflicts are rooted in colonialism. These movements seem to be about places, but will simultaneously impact the wildlife of these spaces. Vice versa is a reality too. Images of polar bear eating urban garbage bring home the environmental destruction of the Arctic most strongly. The movement 
for rewildening of Europe is centered on the re-emergence of the wolf after a century of extinction. Traditions of violence and violence of traditions is constructed narratively. Narratives reflect reality while encouraging recipients to change it. Narratives transform reality when it seems beyond repair. Narratives coming from distant and near past continue to impact our imagination of the future. Wild is ours, narratively, and violence against it has been perpetuated or stopped through narratives. Thank you for listening.